Chapter 33 Edward as King Miles Hendon was picturesque enough before he got into the riot on London Bridge. He was more so when he got out of it. He had but little money when he got in, none at all when he got out. The pickpockets had stripped him of his last farthing. But no matter, so he found his boy. Being a soldier, he did not go at his task in a random way, but set to work, first of all, to arrange his campaign. What would the boy naturally do? Where would he naturally go? Well, argued Miles, he would naturally go to his former haunts, for that is the instinct of unsound minds, when homeless and forsaken, as well as of sound ones. Whereabouts were his former haunts? His rags, taken together with the low villain who seemed to know him, and who even claimed to be his father, indicated that his home was in one or another of the poorest and meanest districts of London. Would the search for him be difficult or long? No, it was likely to be easy and brief. He would not hunt for the boy. He would hunt for a crowd. In the center of a big crowd, or a little one, sooner or later, he should find his poor little friend, sure. And the mangy mob would be entertaining itself with pestering and aggravating the boy, who would be proclaiming himself king as usual. Then Miles Hendon would cripple some of those people, and carry off his little ward, and comfort and cheer him with loving words, and the two would never be separated any more. So Miles started on his quest. Hour after hour he tramped through back alleys and squalid streets, seeking groups and crowds, and finding no end of them, but never any sign of the boy. This greatly surprised him, but did not discourage him. To his notion there was nothing the matter with his plan of campaign. The only miscalculation about it was that the campaign was becoming a lengthy one, whereas he had expected it to be short. When daylight arrived at last, he had made many a mile, and canvassed many a crowd, but the only result was that he was tolerably tired, rather hungry, and very sleepy. He wanted some breakfast, but there was no way to get it. To beg for it did not occur to him. As to pawning his sword, he would as soon have thought of parting with his honor. He could spare some of his clothes. Yes, but one could as easily find a customer for a disease as for such clothes. At noon he was still tramping, among the rabble which followed after the royal procession now, for he argued that this regal display would attract his little lunatic powerfully. He followed the pageant through all its devious windings about London, and all the way to Westminster and the Abbey. He drifted here and there amongst the multitudes that were massed in the vicinity for a weary long time, baffled and perplexed, and finally wandered off, thinking and trying to contrive some way to better his plan of campaign. By and by, when he came to himself out of his musings, he discovered that the town was far behind him, and that the day was growing old. He was near the river, and in the country. It was a region of fine rural seats, not the sort of district to welcome clothes like his. It was not at all cold, so he stretched himself on the ground in the lee of a hedge to rest and think. Drowsiness presently began to settle upon his senses. The faint and far-off boom of cannon was wafted to his ear, and he said to himself, The new king is crowned, and straightway fell asleep. He had not slept or rested before for more than thirty hours. He did not wake again until near the middle of the next morning. He got up, lame, stiff, and half-famished, washed himself in the river, stayed his stomach with a pint or two of water, and trudged off toward Westminster, grumbling at himself for having wasted so much time. Hunger helped him to a new plan now. He would try to get speech with old Sir Humphrey Marlowe and borrow a few marks, and... But that was enough of a plan for the present. It would be time enough to enlarge it when this first stage should be accomplished. Toward eleven o'clock he approached the palace, and although a host of showy people were about him, moving in the same direction. He was not inconspicuous. His costume took care of that. He watched these people's faces narrowly, hoping to find a charitable one whose possessor might be willing to carry his name to the old lieutenant. As to trying to get into the palace himself, 
that was simply out of the question. Presently our whipping-boy passed him, then wheeled about and scanned his figure well, saying to himself, And that is not the very vagabond his majesty is in such a worry about. Then am I an ass, though belike I was that before. He answereth the description to a rag. That God should make two such would be to cheapen miracles by wasteful repetition. I would I could contrive an excuse to speak with him. Miles Hendon saved him the trouble, for he turned about then, as a man generally will when somebody mesmerizes him by gazing hard at him from behind, and observing a strong interest in the boy's eyes, he stepped toward him and said, You have just come out of the palace. Do you belong there? Yes, your worship. Know you, Sir Humphrey Marlowe? The boy started and said to himself, Lord, mine old departed father, then he answered aloud, Right well, your worship. Good. Is he within? Yes, said the boy, and added to himself, Within his grave. Might I crave your favor to carry my name to him, and say I beg to say a word in his ear? I will dispatch the business right willingly, fair sir. Then say Miles Hendon, son of Sir Richard, is here without. I shall be greatly bounden to you, my good lad. The boy looked disappointed. The king did not name him so, he said to himself. But it mattereth not. This is his twin brother, and can give his majesty news of t other Sir Odds and Ends, I warrant. So he said to Miles, Step in there a moment, good sir, and wait till I bring you word. Hendon retired to the place indicated. It was a recess sunk into the palace wall with a stone bench in it a shelter for sentinels in bad weather. He had hardly seated himself when some halberdiers, in charge of an officer, passed by. The officer saw him, halted his men, and commanded Hendon to come forth. He obeyed, and was promptly arrested as a suspicious character prowling within the precincts of the palace. Things began to look ugly. Poor Miles was going to explain, but the officer roughly silenced him and ordered his men to disarm him and search him. "'God of his mercy grant that they find somewhat,' said poor Miles. "'I have searched ye now, and failed, yet is my need greater than theirs.' Nothing was found but a document. The officer tore it open, and Hendon smiled when he recognized the pot-hooks made by his lost little friend that black day at Hendon Hall. The officer's face grew dark as he read the English paragraph, and Miles blenched to the opposite color as he listened. "'Another new claimant of the crown,' cried the officer. "'Verily they breed like rabbits to-day. "'Seize the rascal men, and see ye keep him fast, "'whilst I convey this precious paper within and send it to the king.' He hurried away, leaving the prisoner in the grip of the halberdiers. "'Now is my evil luck ended at last,' muttered Hendon for I shall dangle at a rope's end for a certainty by reason of that bit of writing. And what will become of my poor lad? Ah, only the good God knoweth. By and by he saw the officer coming again, in a great hurry. So he plucked his courage together, purposing to meet his trouble as became a man. The officer ordered the men to loose the prisoner and return his sword to him, then bowed respectfully and said, Please you, sir, to follow me. Hendon followed, saying to himself, And I were not travelling to death and judgment, and so must needs economize in sin, I would throttle this knave for his mock courtesy. The two traversed a populous court, and arrived at the grand entrance of the palace, where the officer, with another bow, delivered Hendon into the hands of a gorgeous official, who received him with profound respect, and led him forward through a great hall lined on both sides with rows of splendid flunkies, who made reverential obeisance as the two passed along, but fell into death throes of silent laughter at our stately scarecrow the moment his back was turned. And up a broad staircase, among flocks of fine folk, and finally conducted him into a vast room, clove a passage for him through the assembled nobility of England, then made a bow, reminded him to take his hat off, and left him standing in the middle of the room, 
a mark for all eyes, for plenty of indignant frowns, and for a sufficiency of amused and derisive smiles. Miles Hendon was entirely bewildered. There sat the young king, under a canopy of state, five steps away, with his head bent down and aside, speaking with a sort of human bird of paradise, a duke maybe. Hendon observed to himself that it was hard enough to be sentenced to death in the full vigor of life, without having this peculiarly public humiliation added. He wished the king would hurry about it. Some of the gaudy people nearby were becoming pretty offensive. At this moment the king raised his head slightly, and Hendon caught a good view of his face. The sight nearly took his breath away. He stood gazing at the fair young face like one transfixed, then presently ejaculated, Lo, the lord of the kingdom of dreams and shadows on his throne. He muttered some broken sentences, still gazing and marveling, then turned his eyes around and about, scanning the gorgeous throng and the splendid saloon, murmuring, But these are real. Verily, these are real. Surely it is not a dream. He stared at the king again, and thought, Is it a dream? Or is he the veritable sovereign of England, and not the friendless poor Tom O'Bedlam I took him for? Who shall solve me this riddle? A sudden idea flashed in his eye, and he strode to the wall, gathered up a chair, brought it back, planted it on the floor, and sat down in it. A buzz of indignation broke out. A rough hand was laid upon him, and a voice exclaimed, Up, thou mannerless clown! Wouldst sit in the presence of the king? The disturbance attracted his majesty's attention, who stretched forth his hand and cried out, Touch him not! It is his right! The throng fell back, stupefied. The king went on. Learn ye all, ladies, lords, and gentlemen, that this is my trusty and well-beloved servant, Miles Hendon, who interposed his good sword and saved his prince from bodily harm and possible death. And for this he is a knight by the king's voice. Also learn that for a higher service, in that he saved his sovereign stripes in shame, taking these upon himself, he is a peer of England, Earl of Kent, and shall have gold and lands meet for the dignity. More, the privilege which he hath just exercised, is his by royal grant. For we have ordained that the chiefs of his line shall have and hold the right to sit in the presence of the majesty of England henceforth, age after age, so long as the crown shall endure, molest him not. Two persons who, through delay, had only arrived from the country during this morning, and had now been in this room only five minutes, stood listening to these words and looking at the king, then at the scarecrow, then at the king again, in a sort of torpid bewilderment. These were Sir Hugh and the Lady Edith. But the new earl did not see them. He was still staring at the monarch, in a dazed way, and muttering, O oh, body o' me, this my pauper, this my lunatic, this is he whom I would show what grandeur was, in my house of seventy rooms and seven and twenty servants. This is he who had never known aught but rags for raiment, kicks for comfort, and offal for diet. This is he whom I adopted, and would make respectable. Would God I had a bag to hide my head in. Then his manners suddenly came back to him, and he dropped upon his knees, with his hands between the kings, and swore allegiance and did homage for his lands and titles. Then he rose and stood respectfully aside, a mark still for all eyes, and much envy, too. Now the king discovered Sir Hugh, and spoke out with wrathful voice and kindling eye, Strip this robber of his false show and stolen estates, and put him under lock and key till I have need of him. The late Sir Hugh was led away. There was a stir at the other end of the room now. The assemblage fell apart, and Tom Canty, quaintly but richly clothed, marched down, between these living walls, preceded by an usher. He knelt before the king, 
who said, I have learned the story of these past few weeks, and am well pleased with thee. Thou hast governed the realm with right royal gentleness and mercy. Thou hast found thy mother and thy sisters again? Good. They shall be cared for. And thy father shall hang, if thou desire it, and the law consent. No, all ye that hear my voice, that from this day they that abide in the shelter of Christ's hospital and share the king's bounty shall have their minds and hearts fed, as well as their baser parts. And this boy shall dwell there, and hold the chief place in its honorable body of governors during life. And for that he hath been a king, it is meet that other than common observance shall be his due. Wherefore note this his dress of state, for by it he shall be known, and none shall copy it. And wheresoever he shall come, it shall remind the people that he hath been royal in his time, and none shall deny him his due of reverence, or fail to give him salutation. He hath the throne's protection, he hath the crown's support, he shall be known and called by the honorable title of the king's ward. The proud and happy Tom Canty rose and kissed the king's hand, and was conducted from the presence. He did not waste any time, but flew to his mother, to tell her and Nan and Bet all about it, and to get them to help him enjoy the great news.